to my basement and welcome to this episode of the Jolly Thoughts podcast. I'm really excited for this one. Um, everybody has to say that they're excited for everything. That's kind of how life life goes now. Uh, I am excited for this one because this is a conversation that I was able to have with a very good friend of mine actually kind of two weeks ago to this day. Um, and uh, we often would get together for coffee. And so we decided uh, one time to actually let the cameras roll. Uh, and so this time um, we did it remotely because it's easier to do that, uh, especially in this day and age. But uh, my good friend Dennis Prescott is on the uh, the podcast today, and uh, we talk about a lot of things. We talk about food is, is mostly what we talk about, and it all kind of sparks out of um, a podcast that I've been kind of listening to off and off for the last few years called the Lord of Spirits podcast, which is a couple of Eastern Orthodox priests, and they 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 banter back and forth, and they they um, they say lots of crazy stuff. But one of the things that they had they had a whole kind of deep cut episode about the nature of sacrifice not just in the bible but kind of in the ancient world in general and they they highlight the fact that sacrifice was always food it was always a meal and so they try to kind of hone in the, on the idea that there's communion. And so we'll, we'll talk a lot about that in the episode. And so I won't bog you down with it in the preamble, but it's important to note that that's the reason I'm having this conversation with Dennis is because Dennis occupies the food world. He's been long known uh, for saying things like food is community. It's kind of a tagline that he um, uh, has bandied about. And so I was like, well, this is a great opportunity for me to rant a little bit about this sort of like the religious aspects of it and but also to get a great counterpoint from somebody who actually lives it and breathes it in the kind of social space so that's what we're going to talk about today we got into some things offline afterwards which were actually really kind of interesting and so there's some things that are left off the table so maybe we'll come back to this at some point in time in the future um but hey uh, without any further ado just a little bit more ado if you've been listening to this kind of conversation and you enjoy it you can feel free to leave a review somewhere. Apparently that's helpful. Or you can just like spread the word to other people that you think will enjoy this conversation. Um, so awesome. Thank you so much for everybody who's been uh, tagging along with us so far along the ride. And here we go. Hey, hi there, ladies and gentlemen. You are joining a conversation that is literally in progress. So uh, we have already been talking about uh, COVID. Um, we've been talking about um, home, home sales and whatnot. Uh, and we've discussed a little bit of coffee because this is normally we would normally convene at some point uh, whenever we could for a, a Friday morning Java, uh, myself and Dennis. But he's been uh, sometimes he's been traveling all over the world, which has not been happening as much for the last year or so. Um, but uh, so we've already been chatting about things, but we decided to push record on this conversation because uh I've been trying to pick his brain about what we're going to talk about for a little while. But the context is, is that I'm joining you from my basement, which is a spare bedroom, which is kind of lime green. Uh, you can't really tell as much, but it is basically, I kind of would blend into the wall uh, if I was up against it. And so it's, it's, uh, it's not nice. It's not a nice room. Nobody's going to put this in a magazine, uh, but it's real life. And also speaking of real life, we are we're recording this on January 21st in the year of our Lord, 2022. And so in Moncton, New Brunswick, that means that my kids are upstairs because they're not at school. And so uh, if you hear this in the future, you should check to make sure that I'm still alive uh, and that also uh, everything has gone well with their education. But at any point in time, you could hear a fight. You could hear uh, something falling on the floor, which is probably my son. You could hear any number of things. And so you just gonna have to roll with those punches. And we're joining Dennis from what is, I think, uh, a, a office slash spare room as well in his world. Slash laundry room slash guitar stuffed in that <laughs> closet somewhere. Uh, yes, this is an everything room, uh, but it works. It works for this. <laughs> Multi-purpose. Um, so like I said, we our, our conversations are often kind of wide ranging and, and, and whatnot. Uh, some people will know who you are. Not everybody will. Uh, we we've known each other for a long time and I, I'll put a, a bit of a, a bio, you know, in the, in the whatever, in the show notes, but, um, more to the point, the reason why I think this conversation would be for, for my perspective, and that's the only perspective that matters, uh, why I think this conversation would be interesting is because of kind of what you've done for the last, um, I'll say five to five to 10 years of your life in particular, we're focusing on, on food and whatnot. So what you give us, if you're open, give us a little snapshot of like kind of what, what you you do, and then particularly kind of if you can angle in on the the idea, like I hear you say all the time, which is that food is 
is community. What does that kind of mean for you? And then how does that kind of tie into your, your career? Yeah. So Mark and I met each other when we were we young lads uh, at the ripe old age of probably 10, I would say, uh, mm-hmm. 10 or 11, and um, became musicians, uh, kind of teaching each other MXPX songs and being in a band and then traveling with other people and then ultimately kind of being in a band together. And that led us to Nashville, which is a incredibly bad way of jumping over about 15 years of my life, which is only to say when I was in Nashville, I kind of fell in love with food. I fell in love with food a little bit while we were touring and remember these like incredible moments, eating curry in England, I'm sure you do in Brighton and, uh, you know, having, having awesome food in Montreal and being in New York city and, you know, food that we didn't grow up on the East coast. We had lobster and spades, uh, and really kind of devalued how inexpensive it was. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, we ate meat and potatoes food, Uh, growing up for the most part. So having all of these super flavorful different foods was incredible. And then in Nashville, I honestly started cooking, I think, as a way of controlling my life. Uh, It felt very amazing to be in a group of creatives who were so inspiring and so kind of passionate it about doing whatever it was that they were doing and, and nobody questioned us when we said they asked us what we did we said we were oh i was a guitar player i'm a bass player I'm whatever no one was like well what do you do for work you know that was the end of the convo because everyone else was living a creative life so it felt really freeing but at the same time i couldn't pay my cell phone bill on time and it was also very stressful so i started cooking i think as a, just a way of control and honestly a creative outlet that i could do that required nothing. There was no intention that it wasn't, Hey, do you want to write it? You need to write a hit song. It wasn't, there was, there was nothing like that. It was just, I want to cook for people because it's fun. And kind of that turned into um, me becoming obsessed with food, only wanting to do food, working, you know, in the oddest way through food, running, ran a coffee and donut shop, uh, with my brother for a while. I did caterings in the Hamptons for a while. I worked in and out. I staged a couple of restaurants. I did the whole thing. Um, and then ultimately found social. Um, actually, Mark, I don't know if you remember this, but you're the one who told me about Instagram initially. And, uh, I and more your life. You did actually. Ch- <laughs> you did. Uh, amazing. Yeah. But because you, you, you had a convo, you're like, have you heard of Instagram? I think you'd really like it. You should download it. And I downloaded it and I just started sharing all of the photos that were, were on my phone, which was all the dishes that I was cooking. I wasn't taking photos of anything else. So as you know, as in a supernatural, uh, no agenda way, my social became a food driven social. And I connected with people all over the world who loved the exact same thing. People who just wanted to feed good food to their friends, to their family and share those moments online which has turned into now me writing cookbooks, uh, working on some TV shows, um, doing socials uh, from a brand ambassadorship side of things and, and kind of traveling all over the world, which I don't take for granted. And I know that that's obviously a Coles note or a cliff note for our friends in the US <laughs> way of explaining 20 years, which is just to say kind of it's all passion driven. And at the end of the day is service driven. When you cook for people, it's about service. And I think it was the same thing when we played music, you know, we were writing music because we wanted other people to have an emotional reaction and a response to that, and hopefully a good one. And when you cook, you want to create that same emotional reaction at the table when people tuck in and have their first bite. And, uh, you know, through that and through learning why I love food and why I love serving people, I realized that food is so much more than food, it's community. And the first time it really hit me was when we were in Nashville and I cooked a dish. It was a chicken korma dish from a Jamie Oliver book. I didn't really know who Jamie Oliver was. I just picked a random book with a smiley, good looking guy on the front cover and cooked this karma dish because it reminded me of being in England when we made a record there. And I wanted to recreate that moment. And we cooked for our friends and studio, you know, guys who were recording at the studio, other musicians. We ate, you know, at these makeshift tables with the camping chairs with beer koozie holders in the side of them. And I made this chicken korma dish. And I remember everybody got quiet just for a second when they took their first bite. And then it got like louder and people got into it and everyone started enjoying. And that was the moment I realized that food is community. It actually has nothing to do with food. It's about the people gathered around the table that create that moment. And then I've gotten to travel and been super fortunate to, to visit countries like Kenya and Ethiopia and Somalia uh, and other places in the developing world 
particularly in East Africa uh, with World Food Program and, the, and World Vision and uh, mostly learning, you know, me being there to learn about what's going on with the, the, the drought situation, learning about more crop resilient and, um, you know, vegetables in ways that pe- we can empower people in that part of the world. And, you know, had the exact same experience. I remember cooking with a woman named Joyce, who's now become my friend, I visited her a number of times, but in the north, in the north of Kenya, and uh, I cooked with her. She spoke only Swahili. I speak obviously only English. I wish I spoke Swahili. And th- there was this wall almost of unintentional wall of division. And just because we didn't know each other and it's weird, we're walking in. We're like, hey, can we cook with you? Can we learn dishes? That's not a normal thing. People don't show up at your house to learn how you make your breakfast. Uh, often. They should because I'm fantastic at pancakes. You are very good. And you make a very good cup of joe. But sure. I remember cooking with her and the moment we started chopping onions, we started joking and laughing and it got super awesome. And we like had the best time. I didn't understand a word she was saying and she didn't understand a word I was. But I remember we hugged at the end of the day. We laughed super hard because it was community. And it's the for me, it's this thing that, you know, music and food are the two things we've shared for as long as humans have been humans. Hmm. And it's the only two things kind of we share it. They're the universal languages, as cheesy as that sounds but they really do bring people together. And I think that, you know, a, a huge part of why I do what I do is because I want to inspire people to spend more time as a community at the table um, with their friends, with their family, because I think that's the best moments that we share as humans. Wow. So I wasn't actually planning to ask this, um, but I think it would be stupid for me not to because I need, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm selfishly taking this opportunity, which is in a, let me see what's uh, about four, five weeks or so we're going to have i'm hosting uh the second annual what they call imagine arts fest at our local church so it's like an opportunity it, it's really it's got such a little agenda but it's basically like focusing on things that are artistic so we've got painting submitted we've got photography submitted music um we started talking a, a few weeks ago about like what would what would culinary arts look like in terms of like if somebody wanted to submit it how would they submit the how do you submit food, I guess, for an arts consideration? Because it's like, is it the aesthetic, is it the visual aesthetic primarily? If it looks fantastic, but you can't taste it, uh, if it tastes like it's a, an artistic experience, but it looks kind of like a homemade experience. So like, and then it's like, if you follow a recipe and do it super um, technically well, but it has no creative element. So it's all craft and no art. Does that count? And so like, I'm just curious. Give me like your your uh, Cliff Notes, uh, uh, Cole's Notes. I was gonna say it's probably Spark Notes for our current generation, or it might be even something uh, beyond that at this point in time. But like, I, I know Cole's Notes is super dating us. <laughs> um, but yeah, how is food art? Is food art? A thousand percent. Uh, food is story, is what I would say. So for me, you know, if you if 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 a person cooks a, a, a dish from a cookbook as an example and they follow the recipe to a tea and it tastes delicious that's awesome and at the end of the day you're feeding your friends your family whoever um that is someone else's story often it's not your story necessarily it could become your story and you can put your own spin on that recipe make it yours change it put your favorite spices in it uh it can become part of your family story as well because it's that dish that you cook every thursday and your kids are super stoked because they can't wait for it but that first time you cook it, it's not your story, right? It's the recipe author's story, it's right. the chef's story, it's the whoever. So I would say from a, an artistic side of things, you, the story needs to be unique. And, it, and, and the best way to tell that is a story that's authentically unique to you and your culinary experience. In the East Coast, you know, our story here is lobster, it's scallops, it's oysters, it's potatoes, uh, it, you know, it's, it's root vegetables because it's winter most of the year and we can't really grow summer vegetables like other places can. Uh, And then it's taking your unique spin on that and telling that. I think that food needs to be, in my opinion, uh, delicious first because it's flavor driven. As a chef, it has to be flavor driven. It can't just be beautifully um, put together and presented and aesthetically pleasing. But it also has to be beautiful because we eat with our eyes. So for me, you eat with your eyes, your nose, and then your mouth. So you need all of those kind of three pillars to create a great dish. Mm. Eyes, ears. No, you don't hear your food. Although I bet you do. Oh, some, you definitely hear them. Yes, yes. 
there are what's it called asmr there are food <laughs> asmr videos all over tiktok of people doing that I guess. Thanks. yes i there are so many bandwagons that i don't think i'll ever understand i mean let alone hop on but to really fully grasp but the asmr one is one that continues to elude me to this day hey if you like it if you love it that's, that's you. Um, so one, that, one benefit I think that you and I have, uh, sorry to interrupt, but the no. one benefit with that is that because we played music for such a long time, we probably have some mild form of tinnitus. So I don't know if it affects <laughs> us in the same way as other people. I actually think I've really escaped it. I don't, I, I continue to hear pins dropping everywhere. Uh, and so I don't know if it's going to come back to haunt me, but I, uh, early adoption to in-ear monitors okay god bless in-ears yeah it made a big difference thing i think for me so that artistic thing that's all for free so if we go back what you were talking about was um the idea that you kind of noticed that food was community and that's food is community is the uh is the hinge point of this conversation because the what i really wanted to get into is i think i don't remember if this is maybe six months ago it could have been longer ago now everything in COVID is variable in terms of time. I sent you a link to a podcast that I've been listening to that I'm kind of mildly obsessed with um, called Lord of Spirits. And it's these two Eastern Orthodox priests who sit there and they, they it's actually a call-in show. So people will call in sometimes and have questions. But for the most part, it's like this two and a half hour to three hour long kind of um, basically it's almost like an it's not it's conversational but it's very scripted in the sense that they know where they're going they're they're working through this essentially really 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 long essay which is about the eastern orthodox faith and so they'll pick topics and then they'll kind of unpack those topics and so the the one that uh caught my attention and thought i i wonder what uh, a number of people but i was like i do wonder what dennis would think about this was one about food it was kind of about food it was actually about sacrifice and it was the idea that uh, in the ancient world, uh, there was no kind of sacrifice. There was no worship. Uh, and by worship, you know, we mean like people coming together to kind of interact with their God, essentially, without sacrifice. And there was no sacrifice without food. A sacrifice was food. Worship was sacrifice. Worship is food. And then the, the, the point that I didn't understand properly, and obviously this is all their kind of context, but I've done some digging and it does for the most part check out even outside of their presentation, is that that worship was community. So the, the point was, sorry, the point was to actually commune, to have an interaction with your God, your your deity. That was the that was the point. So we often, I often uh, think of kind of sacrifice and whatnot as appeasement. So it's a way of of making your God less angry with you, <laughs> uh, you know, like, you know, so that they, they smite you less. And obviously there's, there's aspects of kind of like reconciliation that happens in those things. But, but the, the, the point of reconciliation and the point of appeasement was so that you could connect with and have an experience with this God. Uh, and so food in that sense was community. And I was like, oh, so in, in the episode, he, they go through a number of things, but they actually go back about 10,000 years to these kind of Paleolithic sites, and they discover it, when when um, archaeologists are digging through here, they're finding tremendous amounts of bones, um, and not human bones, but all often kind of cattle. And through reconstruction and whatnot, what it seems obvious is that these were kind of mass uh, mass sites of worship, ritual sites. Uh, a point that's interesting in there is they say, some people try to make the argument that well, these sites were important for people. And so because they were important for people, they came together and then they had these worship celebrations at these sites. But um, there's no indication that nomadic peoples would have these sort of like um, intrinsically or objectively important sites because they were nomadic people. Why would they bother convening? Well, the, the reason is, is they, they had some sort of an experience here. There's something important about this spot because of a, a, a causal effect. And so they posit that they essentially were interacting with spirits here. Spoiler alert, the, the show is very much that they believe that there's spirits everywhere. Uh, and so, you know, they're having an experience with these kind of, you know, divine, cre divine beings. Um, and then because of that, they would sacrifice, they would have a a communal meal there and then more and more people would start to do this and so they became uh sites of worship because they actually had meaning they didn't 
I get meaning because they were sites of worship. This is kind of what they argue. But as you go through the the you know the evolution of the uh, societies, and as you get further on into like kind of what the old what we might call the Old Testament or what Jews would call just their Hebrew Bible, you start to see these worship kind of rituals happening throughout there. And there are no rituals without food or heart. You know, there, there's no there's no um, events that don't include a ritual meal. There's always a meal. Um, and so it, it's fascinating to me that we don't, I, I don't, we can go to church and we can interact with each other without food. Like it happens all the time. People get together and they can't. But it is a dramatically different thing when you introduce food into the equation. I wrote down when you were talking, I was like, there are definitely, you can have food without having a party. But it seems to be really, really, I can't think of any examples of having a party without a food, without food. Um, it, it's like, it, it, it's like a requirement almost <laughs> at the end of the day. If you have a good, even if you want to have a good business meeting, somebody's bringing muffins, right? There's just something about having food that, that changes the water on the beans to use a, a maritime expression, but just like, it just changes the atmosphere. It changes the way that we're doing it. Are you, so is this kind of tracking along with what you, what you observe? Yeah. I, I mean, that's fascinating. And I, I just learned a lot. So I appreciate that. It's a, uh, it's nice. I'm on, I, I, I've been up since, since four. So I'm on my third cup of coffee uh, <laughs> as well. And which I needed to be fully zoned in. Um, I mean, the thing I get from that is that for, you know, this idea of food and community colliding has been, it's, it's not our story. You know, it's not a story of a hundred years ago. It's a story of a millennia ago. Right. And, um, I don't know, I, 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 food is the great leveler, I think, as well. You know, when everybody sits at the table, it doesn't matter what's in your bank account. It doesn't really matter what you're wearing. It doesn't matter what your job is. It doesn't matter who, you know, at nothing. You know, it's right. we're, we're all sharing a meal together. Right. So I think that's, that, you know, I say all the time that I think just societally, we would be better if we spent more time at the table because we would learn about other people. It also humanizes everyone. You know, you don't share a meal and break bread with someone and then get up and have hate in your heart for them. But we live in a world where we spend our time as kind of uh, internet armchair critics and build divisions in our life. Whereas if we were to share a meal, we'd say, yeah, you know, what? I might disagree with that person, but I still love them. I still respect them. They're still another human being. And you know, it's interesting. I, I you know, I, we don't necessarily do what you're talking about today, but we we do a, a version of that, I guess, when we share and break you know break bread together. Because our most favorite times of the year are Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter or or a big birthday party or whatever it is, and no one remembers what they ate. Not a single, unless it's incredible. Very often, we don't remember the food that we ate two years ago at Christmas. Well, unless you have a traditional meal that you eat every year. But you do remember having the best time. And I think that that for me is food just, it, it changes the atmosphere in the room. It is that great like leveler for everyone. It brings everyone at the table regardless of where they're from mm -hmm. and creates just the, the most easy, just the easiest kind of atmosphere for conversation. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously we're coming at this from uh... This, our, our geekeries can collide. This is why I was like, I, it's interesting to me to have this conversation because our geekeries can collide here. So you are in the, you can get in the weeds with food. I don't really know the difference between, you know, cumin and coriander. Um, but I, I'm deeply fascinated by kind of religious uh, rituals and, and obviously the biblical text. Those two things really fascinate me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, my day job is that I'm a, a worship arts pastor at a local church. Your day job. I still don't really understand, to be fully honest, but I know it. I know it's a thing. Uh, you do. You do things. Um, so, but he, he, so you're right. It could have sounded like what I was talking about was like, well, we don't have any kind of like modern equivalent of that. Even if you are somebody who is a, like a, a Christian or who, who attends church, you would think we. I mean, we don't do any sacrifices anymore. You know, uh, the, the one thing to say about that is actually, there's probably a couple, but one that is really interesting to me in this and I'll, I'll drop a link to this episode um, in the show notes not that I'm necessarily expecting a whole bunch of people to listen to two and a half hours of this conversation but um, it's fascinating to me a lot of people have this aversion I think to the Old Testament the idea of sacrifices because uh, we have this sort of like image of this something where essentially the killing of the animal is 
the point. Like, um, there's something about the way that the animal dies. It's supposed to be kind of like a substitutionary thing. And I'm not speaking against that. There's some aspects of that that does kind of relate to Christianity. But the point is, is that and, and what these, you know, Orthodox Christians bring out in this conversation is that the killing of the animal in any of these biblical, at the very least, any of these biblical uh, sacrifices is never actually described in any detail. And the point for that is, is that it's not ritualized. So the meal that you share is ritualized. It has things that you can say while you're doing it. It has ways that you should participate in it. But the killing of the animal is essentially incidental to the fact that you are having this meal. So it's all well and good to say, you know, barbaric people from these thousands of years ago who killed animals to have sacrifices while you're eating a hamburger. Um, an animal went into the making of your meal as well. So uh, there's, and I'm not here to preach about veganism because I had a hamburger last night. Um, but the, the point is, is that you can't, it, it's really, it's important to understand that the killing of the animal is incidental to the ritual, at least in Christian tradition. It's not the point of the ritual. So that's, that's one thing to bring out. And the other thing is, yes, in the church today, and really since Jesus, we don't believe in animal sacrifices, we don't believe in that sort of thing, but we have not given up on belief in A, the belief in ritual, or B, surprisingly, the belief in sacrifice. What we understand is that Jesus has transformed how that works. And so um, communion, and this is practiced in every kind of church you go to, Roman Catholic, Baptist, any denomination that you can possibly think of, if they call themselves Christian, in some way, um, they are participating in something that is either known as communion or the Lord's table or Eucharist. You've seen it, even if you've hardly ever been to church before in your life. You, it's you know, it's a little bit of bread, it's a little bit of wine, it's something that happens together, and that is essentially a transformation of one of the most kind of basic ritual meals that was taken from the the people of Israel, the Passover meal. It's a it's a a remix of that that happened um, kind of through Christ. He instituted that himself. But it's also this really interesting little twist, which is that, and it was turns out that this little twist was embedded in Old Testament religion. So you, a lot of the idea with a lot of these, I'm going to use the word pagan, which is um, not necessarily communicative, but like let's just say the pre-Christian or non-Christian religions, the idea was very often that it felt like the people were offering food to the God so that the God could in some respects not only be appeased but be fed like this is somehow they were hosting the God so when they went to this place whether it was a temple or whether it was just a, a ritual site they were the hosts so they're showing up with the food but in the Old Testament uh, Yahweh the, 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 the God of Israel flips the script and when he starts to have a temple even before this when he starts to have a, a tabernacle like a mobile tent um, and you can fact check me on this if I'm wrong, somebody. The, he, he prescribes something in there that the bread is, is provided by him. Now, it's the priests who are baking the bread. Nobody says that Yahweh's hands come down and knead the dough, whatever. But symbolically, there's always some bread that's available in the, the place of worship. And sometimes it's called like show bread or the bread of the presence. But the point is, is he's like, I don't need you to feed me. You are not the host in this scenario. I am the host. When you come to worship, yes, you're going to bring something that costs you something. When I go to your house, well, if my wife makes me, um, then I'm going to offer something nicely when I go. But that does not mean that I am the host. You are the host. You are having me into your presence. And I am the one who provides. And so this Old Testament um, kind of like image gets not just transformed, but super amplified in Jesus where he says, I am the bread of life, right? He says, so that when, when Jesus offers himself, he becomes essentially the sacrificial meal. And this is where, um, you know, if you're listening to this and, and because you tuned in for some other reason, then I'm not going to go into great, tremendous detail here. This is actually from very early on in the Christian story. This became a real problematic thing for a lot of people because, and there's actually recorded in the, in the book of John when Jesus says, you know, you know, if you got kids listening, you know, he says, you know, if you don't eat my bread and or eat my flesh and, and drink my blood, then you can't have any any presence, any 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 part of the kingdom. A lot of people, it's recorded in, in it's recorded in the Bible. Uh, they were like, uh, this is a hard teaching. 
I, we don't think we like this. And so a lot of people left at this point in time. So it's obviously been a pretty polarizing thing for, for a very long time. And so you have to you know, wrestle with whether it's metaphorical. I mean, I don't think it's literal because uh, I haven't eaten any of Jesus's flesh or drank any of his blood. But, but the, the point is, is that he's saying like, I am the meal, not just because I am food, but because I am the point of community. So when you come to me and when you want to come to God, when you want to come to the divine, you, there is no party without food. This party I'm the food. I'm the one who's offering myself so that you can come and so you can be a part of this community. And so it's it's div- it's a relationship this way where you're able to connect with with God. But and this is where the two worlds collide, Dennis, is that it's not just this way. Is it turns out that when you want to party with God, you're also partying with the other people who want to party with God. Like like you talked about this kind of leveling leveling effect. And so when you come together, and this is actually a huge problem that happened in the early church, recorded in uh, the book of 1 Corinthians and I think a few other places, where people were coming together to worship God at what should have been a very level table, but they were having different experiences. So some people had so much food uh, and so much wine that they were getting kind of blato at this event, and other people showed up and they weren't getting enough. You know, they, they were still hungry. Um, and so, you know, Paul was saying like, this, this can't be like, if we're supposed to be having the same experience, if we're sharing the same meal, there's no distinction, whether you're rich or poor, whether you came with a lot or whether you came with little, when you come, we're all partying with the, with the King. And so we have to be kind of fed by him. Um, and the, the anecdote that tripped me up on this, uh, I, I think I mentioned this to you before, but problem with communion now in a virtual world so if you're like doing remote church which almost everybody in North America has at least if they've been engaging with church for the last little while and I think I haven't looked to see what the Catholics have been doing with this but I know that they have they have figured out some sort of way to do this remotely as well but our, our particular church tradition is not super formal when it comes to communion anyway uh, but nonetheless that the point is is that you know, you shouldn't have, you don't bring your communion elements with you to church normally when you have communion. <laughs> they show up and they go, hey, whether you walked in with uh, a Rolex Both on your, <laughs> exactly, when you walk in, if you w- walk in with a Rolex or whether you walk in with like an Iron Man watch or whatever, like you're still going to be able to have the same meal at church today. Like this is a, a very leveling thing. This is the idea. You don't get seated dep- depending upon your, your retirement savings. So that becomes a problem when you're not actually providing the elements. So if you're having a remote church service and you're at home, you're like, hey, you know, make sure you get your bread and your grape juice or whatever. And you're like, well, what if they don't have bread and grape juice? Like you you lose control now of, of the actual elements. You can say that regardless of what kind of elements you take, they're all, they're all blessed and they're all good, but you're kind of like, you, you start to notice it, it has made you, it has created a distinction between these people. So one time while I was doing this remotely, I was speaking off the cuff, which is something that I should never do. I was speaking off the cuff and I was basically saying like, you know, whatever you have in your in your pantry or in your fridge, go ahead and get that, you know, whether it's crackers or whether it's bread or, you know, whether it's mac and cheese. And then I said, you know, if the mac and cheese is the right consistency, it, it, it could work for both the, the, the bread and, and the wine, I guess. You could both eat it and drink it. Uh, and so the point that I was trying to amplify for people was, at the end of the day, whatever you have, it's not the important. It's not important because it's God who's going to bless it, and it's God who's going to make it meaningful to you in that moment. I had a few people who pushed back on me afterwards from that comment, and if I had my way, if I had my time back, I probably wouldn't have quite said it like that. But it, well, it I'll am- tell you from a uh, from a chef's perspective, I would push back on the consistency side of things. <laughs> and if it works as a drink, yeah, haven't you haven't made your cheese sauce? You know, you you, you need you need some work. That room needs a little work. <laughs> you know, I, you're you're right. And yet, the funny thing is, with my kids, like we, uh, you mentioned Jamie Oliver earlier. Like we have a, among some of the cookbooks we have, we have a Jamie Oliver cookbook, which has this like gorgeous mac and cheese in it, like this kind of homemade, like it's not Velveeta, but it, it's like real. You make a, like an actual cheese sauce, whatever, and it's just like, oh my gosh, it's just beautiful. And then you can do breadcrumbs on top and stuff. It's lovely. And we make that, and uh, our kids, 
they turn up their noses at that like what is this garbage and then you take out the 69 cent box of like craft dinner or like Anne's shells or whatever it's like now that that is what mac and cheese is supposed to be like so it's such a shot to the ego <laughs> I, so it's funny i will like not to interject but i will say it's interesting you know a couple of quick thoughts it's interesting that to me all food is sacrifice and uh we have glamorized food i've just i've never heard it put in the way that you put it which i think is, is fascinating we've glamorized not i was gonna say food some foods yes uh, but we've certainly glamorized people who cook you know uh, whether they're chefs or, 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 you know, cooks who are cooking online or in the, the influencer space, as much as I don't love that word. Um, we've glamorized this idea of being a person who cooks uh, almost to the point where a lot, well, you know, a lot of people in this space are, you know, massive celebrities and great and good for them. And truthfully, I'm very grateful that that, that whole world exists because it's allowed me to have a career. You know, people will get into wanting to cook, uh, especially from a, a very romantic side of things where they say like you know they they want to be the person who they see on tv on 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 food network or whatever and then they actually start to do the job of cooking and realize oh this is this is a lot you know you have to legit you chop onions for eight hours a day when you start you know in 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 a, in a professional kitchen or whatever it's sacrifice you know at the end of the day you are you have to work very hard um but it's an act of love you know, everyone who everyone who I know who cooks, cooks because they want to serve people, because they want to love on people, they want to create an amazing experience. You have to love it to want to do it because it's hard work. And, um, you know, it's obviously very different in the sacrifice that we're talking about, you know, from 2000 years ago, but it is still a sacrifice every time. And the other thing that is fascinating is, you know, my friend Arthur, Hot Dawson, who's an incredible chef from the UK, always says, he's like, whether you're a vegan, a vegetarian, or you eat only steak three meals a day, something has to die for you to eat. Whether you're culling a cauliflower head uh, or whether you're you're eating a, you know, venison, something dies. So it, it requires some amount of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that a lot specifically in, uh, in East Africa when I visited because I've cooked with families and when you cook, um, you know, very blessed that they, you know, wanted to honor us when we would come as visitors and they would they'd serve a chicken. And, you know, that meant me helping to kill that chicken. Um, and the experience of doing that really changes how you view the food system as a whole, because globally, specifically in Western countries, uh, in North America and Western Europe, we've lost are we've lost the complete connection between us and our food system, where now our food is cellophane wrapped in the grocery store. And we don't actually think something was sacrificed for us to eat that hamburger whereas in the mass majority of the world they still have a, a close connection with their food system because if they want to eat a burger if you, if you eat burgers where they are they have to kill that cow you know and uh so and and the respect level that's given in those communities when that cow when that chicken when that goat whatever it is dies is intense and it's beautiful and they really care and they use the entire animal um you know obviously very different from a you know a spiritual sacrifice or something that in in that kind of a way but there's still a, a there's an, a massive respect for what is actually happening that I feel like we have lost. And I think that we would gain a lot in North America um, if we realized what our food system actually is and kind of got back to the root of that. And I wonder how that would change our connection at the table. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we got to wrap up here, but I, one last thing I want to kind of pop into the, there's a, a few things that I would say, but I will end with this one. And I'll kind of get your, you mentioned earlier where you're like, if you sat down at the table, it's harder to stand up and, and hate the person that you were just eating with. And this, that's sort of like a utopian, that's all. I, I like the future. The future sounds nice. And I do, I do like the future. The future is going to be good. Um, but what's fascinating about that as a parallel is, and I'm sure you've read these parts of the Bible before, like, especially in the New Testament where um, if somebody is kind of not in fellowship with you, like the idea, like, so it was a big deal for Jesus, for example, to eat with quote unquote Pharisees and sinners. This gets brought up all the time. Not with Pharisees, sorry, with sinners and tax collectors, for example, they'd be like, man, this guy is eating with bad people. This is what Pharisees would say. But then he would also go and eat with 
Pharisees. And so, and then people would be like, man, is he a friend of the Pharisees? So like who he ate with seemed to make a big deal. Uh, it was like, oh, like, is he in relationship with these people because he's eating with them? Whereas I don't necessarily think of it that way. Um, Paul also says, I can't remember in which letter it is, but it's like, there's a person who is essentially in their community who is doing things that are pretty, pretty bad. Uh, he's an unrepentant sinner. So somebody who is breaking the, what they agreed to, right? Hey, we all agreed to some things. And now this person has decided to not do those things. And there's been warned, Hey, you should, you should change the way you're behaving. He says, I do not want to change the way I'm behaving. A few people go to him and say, Hey, you should change the way you're behaving. He says, I don't want to change the way I'm behaving. And so eventually he says, you, you should just let this person go out of your community. And it says with such a person, do not even eat. So like, don't even sit at the table with this person, presumably because it's, it would show a level of relationality, a level of kind of like acceptance that is no longer worthy of this person. Um, do you think that who you eat with, um, like if you sit down at the table with somebody in, the, in North America, does it seem like you're accepting them? Does it seem like you're humanizing them? I mean, I think that that's a fascinating question. And, you know, I, I certainly don't want to sound blasphemous, blasphemous uh, in, in disagreeing with Paul. Um, but, <laughs> Feel free. But I do think, you know, I, I, I uh, and I'm also, you know, not coming from this, from a, a pastoral sense, of course, Absolutely. Uh, as, as, as you are. For me, I just, I feel like, like I said, I mean, we need more conversations with people we disagree with. Uh, I do think that there's a level where it's like if I fund it, I don't know if I, um, I don't know if I would ha share a meal with Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, or something along those lines, but maybe more people should, you know, in the sense, like, I don't, I actually don't know that terrible example, horrible example, but I'm just glad you didn't say Hitler, because that seems like that one's been used a lot recently, so. I, I do think that you need to you need to kind of search your soul, find your core values, uh, you know, and 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 be open to new opportunities and new conversations. I, I do think you know, for me, like I said, I think what food does is it humanizes everybody because you're all sharing. You're sitting at the same level playing at the table, same level playing field. I definitely don't don't think that that means that you agree with people when you get up from the table. I definitely don't think that that means that you need to be in agreement or ex in acceptance of how they poten you know potentially live their life or their life choices or anything like that. But I just think that it's good in the sense that we live in such polarized um, you know bubble worlds. Uh, you know, even the algorithm feeds me things that I want to be fed now, you know, and it doesn't feed me things that don't, you know, are, are outside of the things that I want to be fed. And I don't think that that's good. I don't think that that creates a rounded narrative where you're open to new ideas. And I think, you know, as, you know, people who want to be life learners and people who want to constantly challenge the, their own status quo and ch constantly want to grow and learn and progress you can't just be around people who are exactly like you. And I think that that's, you know, so do, do I, do I think to answer your question that there's certain people I might not share a meal with? I'm not sure is the answer to that. Cause I'd have to evaluate that person at the time. But I do think that I want to be able to share meals with people and still get up and go, you know what? I, I, I don't, I didn't love that, but I learned a little, if not about them, at least about myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bring back the church potluck. Uh, bring back the post COVID, bring back the church potluck because I'll tell you what, I had some incredible sandwiches filled with some like cream cheese and cherries, pink yeah. cherry thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are not incredible. I don't like the no, people who not. bring those. I did like the lasagna though. I will, I, 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 I will not lie. And when we were kids, there was always orange soda from McDonald's. <laughs> the orange drink. Remember that <laughs> that uh, always makes me think of that Simpsons episode. Uh, make sure to grab some orange drink for the long drive home. Um, yeah, but potlucks are like, or that's what happens at a church is like, unfor unfortunately, we can streamline ourselves so we can choose, you know, if you go to a church, you can, well, what's the right church for me? Where's the church that people think exactly like I do, whatever. But in a, in a perfect world, a church would just be in a, perfect world in in what i'm describing as a potentially perfect world the church would just be a place that you go because you want to connect with 
the divine and so you would go there and so you would be with a whole bunch of people who also want to connect with the divine but who might not share your political views might not share your socioeconomic status might not definitely don't share your gender um or your race right like you just and so you're going to have a whole swath of different perspectives but then you're going to sit down at the table whether that's literally through you know the the practice of communion or eucharist or whatever or whether it's through the uh, the holy potluck that can happen, you know, quarterly after after church or whatever, and you're going to end up having conversations, and you're going to look in the eyes of people that you don't like, people that you disagree with, but you're going to be sharing a meal with them based upon your shared value, um, and you're gonna, that's going to change you. And so, I think that's one of the greatest. Um, I think that's actually one of the superpowers of the church, is its ability to bring people together who are different but around a common cause, and uh, to put a bow on it probably also one of the superpowers of food if you go to a restaurant one of your favorite restaurants even if that's whether that's mcdonald's or uh some sort of a michelin five star four star how many stars do michelin's have four four uh really high-end <laughs> restaurant um there's three you'll be around people who are com- completely dissimilar from you in many many ways but you're you're being brought there because of food so i think in closing the hibachi grill is the most optimal experience in food <laughs> yes. and i will say this quickly so you go to i agree, I agree with all what you just said hibachi grill incredible uh super fun if you've never gone with your friends and also you sit around with people you don't know and it's just like hey man tell me your story yeah. Yeah. yeah so when i when i've spent time i i know i've talked a lot about kenya but it's just the closest example that i can use for this when I, when you go to a lot of the uh, uh communities that at least in the parts of Kenya that I've been, both in the north, uh, in the mountain mountain region near A10, uh, where all the Olympic athletes train and Olympic runners, or in the south in Zakunzi and in Mombasa area, outside of the city, when people eat, they eat as a community. And I experienced that in, in uh, literally the entire village will eat together often. Yeah. And our food and our meals here are, you know, far and away, and away are spent in front of the TV and and checking out and i'm not saying that in a judgmental way because truthfully i do it sometimes too but you can guarantee that when that village comes together they don't all agree on everything just in the same way that we don't all agree on everything but they are happier they have more joy they're more content and everyone's there for each other and i think that that's the thing that is what food is community is it's in spite of our differences in spite Light of our situation, we're going to come together as a big family and break bread together. And we're going to go away from this. And tomorrow we're going to come back again. And I think that we have lost connection with that. I remember a few years ago, I was in New York City. I was walking in near the um, Wall Street area and there was a big ledge kind of enclosing a park, but low enough kind of that everyone could put their arms on it. And everyone was eating facing away from the street facing this ledge and I was like this is the saddest thing that I've ever seen it was a hundred people eating separately together right and and I think that you know that's the opposite so I say that to say you're right I think church potlucks do that inherently and I think we need more of that you know you go to these communities uh in blue zones around the world where people live to be a hundred years old on average and they all eat together there's something important about sharing a meal together that I don't think that we fully appreciate um, that goes way beyond the food that we eat. Well said, Dennis. Well said. Well, hey, thanks for spending a few minutes uh, on, on record as opposed to off record. Um, appreciate it. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and po- push pause on this recording now. So that uh, so say goodbye, Dennis. Hey. Hi, everybody. <laughs>